Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théâtres, des photos de bord de mer, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Let that to the president here, all right? We always have a speed bump with all presidents, all right? And, and very briefly, we, we got to get into the room, we got to get into his head, but we go through different doors. Our door says facts, his door, his door says vision, you know, the one you voted for. Fact, vision, world as it is, world as we would like it to be. Mm -hmm. We're inherently inductive, data, data, general conclusions. Inherently deductive first principles, again, the ones you voted for, how do I apply to a specific circumstance? So this, is, this, is, this exists all the time. And we, it's our job to work our way through it and get into the president's head. We, we always knew that if Donald Trump were going to become president, that this was going to be a heavier than average lift. Because all those traits over here, he had two or three extra doses from the creator. Instinctive, <laughs> spontaneous, pretty naturally self-confident. Okay? And yeah. so we knew this was going to be hard. It, it, it is a national tragedy that the first time we had to go and jump that speed bump was down the street here on the 6th of January when we had to go brief the president on, on a matter that a lot of other Americans, not us, but a lot of other Americans were using to challenge his very legitimacy to be the president of the United States. It was a perfect storm. We went into a ditch and we're still trying to work our way clear of the effects of being in that ditch. Explain that. What happened? <clears throat> well, um, we gave them the briefing. Uh, they broadly accepted that the Russians had done something. They didn't argue that. They said in the meeting, but it didn't affect the election, Jim Clapper and company said, uh, we're not saying that. We have no art or science that measures how they can or can't affect, did or didn't affect the election. About two hours later, uh, Team Trump went out and gave a press briefing, thanked the guys for coming, and a very briefing. Thank God the Russians didn't affect the election. Right. Flew right, flew right in the face of what it was the team said, we can't say one way or the other. And apparently, Willie, they were talking about that in front <coughs> of the briefers, saying, how do we spin this? I, right. Yeah, they were. They did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It is Wednesday, the 2nd of May of 2018, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam, and our daily special is Smothered Benedict Wednesdays. Well, uh, Paul Ryan got rid of his priest, but uh, <laughs> that's the problem with Paul Ryan. He is such a failed Catholic, even though he practices... Yes, there are practicing Catholics who are still failed Catholics. And Paul Ryan, I can attest, is the, well, is actually very emblematic. Yes, very emblematic of the failed Catholic. A practicing failed Catholic. Look, I mean, come on. He's not going to help the least of these? The least of these are the scary people? Uh, huh. Well... We had words for him back in the day, but uh, we cannot say that here because we've determined, even though this is, you know, the internet, uh, we're going to, you know, clean it up a little bit in the mornings. Of course, if you're listening to this by podcast, it could be at any time of the day, but eh, sometimes I feel like it and sometimes I don't. 
Oh boy! Uh, so uh, Trump's on a uh, Twitter rage, and well, a general rage actually, which which is very scary because next thing you know, uh, Iran may now have uh, the nuclear capability to destroy the world. So we have to destroy it first because we are America. We can't let anybody else destroy the world. That's our job, our God-given duty. And uh, so we have to be careful because uh, when the president is tense, the the tense in the sentence structure may be backwards and uh, we could be in big, big trouble. But no, uh, uh, Trump is raging about uh, the Mueller questions now. <sighs> Mueller didn't leak these questions and Mueller never wrote these questions. That was wholly done within the Trump team. And, uh, oh, thank you, uh, General Hayden at the top, explaining how uh, the uh, Trump team laughed off Russian help. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. Okay, uh, you know, you've covered your ass. Now get out of here. What? Yeah, James Clapper and others that were in there briefing uh, the Trump team were poo-pooed and sent on their way. Trump had said, or uh, uh, Clapper and others, and I think uh, Mike Hayden is privy to this, uh, because I think he was there, um, said yes, uh, and and we we really cannot tell you that there hasn't been an actual influence here, because we don't have the science for that particular question. But, uh, but that doesn't mean that it didn't happen. And he's trying to explain to him. So you can't go out and tell people, oh, well, you know, the Russians had nothing to do with it because we can't measure that right now. And Trump went right out and said, no collusion, no, no interference. Russians didn't help. Everything else is now a witch hunt. Get out of my way. I want to break into anybody's uh, medical office just because I want to get dirt on him. You look out, John Tester. I'm looking at you, John Tester. Does Trump know that John Tester, you know, has a mangled hand from, uh, you know, actually being a worker on a farm and working with heavy equipment, heavy farm equipment? Does he know that? Maybe that's why he has to steal medical records, even his own. So, yeah, here's a guy who just went right out and said, no, Russian Russians didn't help. Then as John Barron or somebody, maybe it was uh, Dennison, maybe he called up as Dennison and dictated his uh, health records so that Bornstein would, you know, tell the line. And Sarah Huckabee Sanders, it is not standard operating procedure for thugs to go into a medical office, whether it is the president's medic, you know, private doctor or not, and break in and steal stuff. It's just not done. Now, that may be standard operating procedure in a construct that is an organized mob. Yeah, well, it's not smoky eye she's got. I'm telling you, there's something else there. She calls herself a Christian, but this whole this whole group, I think, is embraced by white evangelicals because white evangelicals actually do want to bring down the destruction of the world because in there, I don't know, what are they, what are they thinking? When I'm dead, I'm going to be risen and, you know, pulled by my top knot to heaven with the pearly gates and not heaven on Venus, because I got to tell you, Venus is really hell. Anybody tells you that, you know, vision is pulling you to Venus and is going to be milk and honey. Uh, has never uh, followed the uh, satellite flybys of Venus and seen what a hell hole it is. And it's literally a hell hole. Hot, too. Very hot. So, uh, white evangelicals do want to bring about the destruction of the world. And I got to tell you, Trump fits everything that we have seen about uh, what the Antichrist will be in modern American society. Because our religious construct of the world is the only one that matters now, doesn't it? Yep, it's all in the movies. You'll learn everything in the movies. Devil's advocate. Uh-huh. That's what happens. 
Well, what else is happening in the world? Oh, ecstasy may relieve the agony of PTSD. I don't know. It could. Look how many raves were popular. People had to go to raves for some reason. I went to a couple, but uh, I don't know. I'm a singer-songwriter, and, you know, I, I, I love to dance, too. And, I don't know. Mine's not necessarily danceable. Oh, three white Oklahoma men are arrested in a modern-day lynching because, you know, lynchings don't happen anymore. There's no more racism anymore, so we don't have to worry about it. We we elected a black guy, so all racism is dead, except for these three white Oklahoma men who lynched two black men. Yes, killed, killed them, and, and even one of their mothers helped because, you know, what are mothers for? <laughs> yeah, okay, well... Uh, so much more news out there. Uh, uh, at Texas Elementary School, principal joked about telling police that a special needs black kid had a gun. And that's a death sentence, you know? Oh, yeah, I'm just going to tell that that little spastic kid over there has a gun. Then the cops will come in and go, oh, my God, that's a monster. Look out! Look at the size of that monster. Ah, and they have to kill it. And then uh, they realize it's just a little kid. And they go, I don't know. It looked like Godzilla to me. And we were told if you see a Godzilla, you, you, you better start firing as much as you got. And we'll litigate it later. And they always do. Oh, boy. Well, we could go on and on and on and on and, and – uh, I mean, we could talk about how bad Mueller's questions could be for Jared Kushner. We could, you know, where's Roger Stone in this? I think Roger Stone's somewhere in the midst of this, too. And what I want, wanted to mention about, you know, Mueller doesn't leak. So this came from the Trump camp. And they are leaking out tidbits of info. And the New York Times is glomming on to it, as the New York Times does, because it is breaking news. <sighs> But this is what Putin did. This is even what the uh, Politburo in uh, Russia would do when, uh, you know, TASS would uh, would uh, issue reports about the health of their leaders. Exactly like it. But you got to have more of an institutional memory than Kanye West has, apparently. I would think. So, okay, what are we attending to in the rest of the day here at the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Well, police fired rubber bullets and tear gas at peaceful May Day protesters in Puerto Rico. Yeah, you know, they're just out there protesting the austerity measures. Like, yeah, you know, you don't have any power, so get used to it. We're going to cut off what little you have. Teachers, uh, you got to take a big pay cut, okay? I mean, look, your country's a shithole. Look at it. It's devastated. And uh, we're not going to clean anything up. And you're on your own. And people were protesting. And, and, and so the cops had to, you know, do what cops do. And that's fire rubber bullets and tear gas on peaceful protesters. Yes, they also do have constitutional guarantees, even though they're brown people in a U.S. protectorate. Okay. I just want to make it clear. Fake Antifa posts tricked police into the massive show of force for the neo-Nazi rally uh, there in Noonan, Georgia. Yeah, why Why were there so many cops? Because, I don't know, cops are susceptible to being brainwashed? Maybe. And Trump's big mouth just undercut his own administration's defense of his Muslim ban. He just can't shut up. After the break, we'll move to the chef's table where the deputy attorney general defiantly insists the DOJ will not be extorted. And a new study reveals university lower division science textbooks are woefully underrepresenting climate change. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit.
to the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com. You'll notice the chat room link, of course, on the right-ish of the page. And as a gentle reminder, and uh, as new information to those just tuning in, Kelly Link and our Roaring Girl does monitor the chat room link uh, quite diligently throughout the day. And uh, if she doesn't respond right away, she will respond. And uh, the chat room link tends to be open, so... uh, Go there. To the leftish of the chat room link are the contribute donate buttons, and those are an important ingredient to, well, not only our homepage, but Netroots Radio as a whole, because your generosity keeps the lights blinking in their proper order. And uh, that's uh, that's important. And thank you for your generosity. We are unable to do this without you. Uh, follow Netroots Radio on Twitter at Netroots Radio. Tom uh, administers that uh, platform. You can uh, check us out on Facebook. I put up show notes occasionally there. I should be more diligent in that myself. I don't administer the page, but uh, I think Kelly takes care of that mostly. So, yeah, we're on Facebook if you want to go there. Uh, I do post uh, show notes and links on Daily Co's. Uh, of each day's show and uh, about 10 minutes before showtime. And I'm on Daily Co's as Justice Putnam. And you can follow me on Twitter at Justice Putnam. Podcasts of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy can be had by way of Stitcher, Spreaker, TuneIn, iTunes. I don't know, maybe iHeart. I I sort of avoid it myself. I don't know about you. But, uh, yeah, you can find uh, West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy even on YouTube. We're on YouTube. So, uh uh, no, no video, but you get to see a nice picture that I took of a, of a little, uh, still life. <laughs> That's right. A photograph of a still life. Okay. So yeah, uh, do, uh, do get the podcast. Um, and if you would rate it on whatever platform you're at, I guess I'm at that point where, um, I should probably request that maybe you could, uh, rate these, uh, West coast cookbook and speakeasy podcasts. And that way it'll move it up in the search engine. Because that's how they do it. All right. So starting off here in the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays, is an article out of Think Progress by Addie Baird. Puerto Ricans clashed with police in the streets of San Juan after protests against austerity measures took a violent turn yesterday. The demonstration was in protest of proposed cuts to retirement benefits and loose labor laws, as well as school closures and slow hurricane recovery efforts. One woman, uh, Adria Bermudez, told the AP that she was marching to protest the increase of the undergraduate cost per credit from $57 per unit to $115 per unit. Why, that's that's quite nice. Thank you very much. 100%. Then to an eventual $157 per unit over five years. Uh, back in the day, uh, I think like 16 units per quarter was quite a full load. So 16 times 157. Wow. Okay. She also called the government officials and legislatures to reduce their salaries instead of implementing more austerity measures. Well, I hate to break it to Andrea Bermudez, but the, uh, the, the those government officials and legislators are not lowering their salary for anyone. The reason you got to pay more is because they're raising their salaries. God, I wish people would get that. I mean, <laughs> somebody has to lord over people. Okay, the measures are aimed at the middle class and low middle class, she said. The rich don't suffer. Of course not. That's why they're rich. Protests uh, reportedly became violent after hundreds of young protesters tried to enter the Haddo Ray neighborhood, San Juan's banking center. Kind of like Wall Street. Uh Uh-oh, they wanted to occupy their Wall Street. And, uh, you know, the Praetorian Guard are just not going to have that. There, according to Bloomberg, helmeted police officers wearing gas masks formed lines to block them from advancing. When the protesters tried to push their way through the police line, the officers responded by indiscriminately firing rubber bullets and tear gas at 
peaceful protesters. Yeah, you got the skirmish line coming at you. Hit the innocent ones because, you know, that way, uh, you know, that'll teach them. They brought it on themselves. Okay, uh, so uh, police officers even uh, arrested protesters onto private property onto which protesters were invited. Oh, yeah, well, it's not private property anymore, especially when we've deemed it so. Okay, just call it quartering for a moment while we get this little scaff law. And uh, one woman reported that police had arrested an activist who has been working to provide solar and water to his community in the wake of Hurricane Maria. And that police beat him after he'd been handcuffed. And then they went into the home of another activist. She wasn't even in the protest. Beat the crap out of her and hauled her off to jail, too. Wow. This sounds so much like the movie Witness, you know, when they just went out and got all the teachers and the leftists and threw them into the soccer stadium. And the next thing you know, they're dead. Okay. The protests come as Puerto Rico is still trying to recover from the devastating effects of Hurricane Maria. More than seven months later, about 30,000 people on the island still do not have power. And a recent Politico report confirmed that the Trump administration favored Texas recovery efforts over those in Puerto Rico because, well, Trump hates Puerto Ricans. He's from New York, after all. Jeez, have you ever seen West Side Story and all of its various updated permutations? You got the Puerto Rican gang, and then you got the Jets. The Bosch recovery effort has had a devastating effect on the mental health of those living in Puerto Rico, too. Reports of suicide attempts on the island more than tripled between November of 2017 and January of 2018. Tripled in a month. Well, two months. Now Puerto Rico is trying to overcome a recession that has lasted more than a decade, as well as restructure a portion of a $72 billion public debt. Let's not forget that, uh, you know, they had venture vulture capitalists coming down there. You know, vulture singer, vulture singer, that guy. Venture capitalists coming down there, uh, imposing extremely hard debt, and then imposing austerity measures to collapse the government so that they can extract the wealth from that body. So let's not forget how they got there in terms of that debt. And economists have warned that the poverty rate on the island could rise from 45% to as high as 60%. Gosh. Remember when like 8% unemployment was considered bad? And of course, now the Atlantic hurricane season officially begins again in one month. Well, that's okay. There's not as much to destroy this time now, is there? up is an article also out of Think Progress, this time by Casey Michael. One of the big questions hanging over last month's neo-Nazi rally in the small town of Newton, Georgia, centers on the outsized police presence that showed up to keep tabs on the event. Why did hundreds of heavily armed police, numbering over 700, show up in force for a paltry turnout of a few dozen white supremacists? going so far as to swing their guns at counter-protesters. Why did police act like they expected thousands more people who could potentially incite violence to arrive? Thanks to a public records request, we may finally have an answer and one that does not reflect well on local authorities. Emails obtained uh, by Unicorn Riot, a self-described decentralized nonprofit media organization. Oh, really? Revealed that officials from the Coweta County Sheriff's Office shared a Facebook post with one another in the lead up to the rally, claiming that counter protesters in Union 
had dotted the city with stockpiles of urine, feces, Kansas pepper spray, or wasp spray, and baseball bats, among other weapons. It was the counter, the anti-fascists that did this now. Okay. The Post estimated that upwards of 13,000 white supremacists and as many counter-protesters may show up. Well, 26,000. And claim that people will be targeted if they wear any clothing supporting Trump, America, or anything that leads right. This is a Facebook post that the cops shared among themselves. Okay. Almost sort of like what we used to say in football in high school, a spirit drill. You know, to to increase the bloodlust that you got so you can go out and knock the crap out of the other team. Lieutenant Colonel Tony Grant, who forwarded the Facebook post to the rest of the higher-ups at the department, wrote, Don't guess these folks have heard of Team Coetta. We're going to go out and kick ass. Kick the hippies. There was one major problem, though. The Facebook post the Coweta County Sheriff's Office shared with one another appears not to be from any reputable information source, but from the Facebook account of Clay Perry, a self-described patriot who said he's read Antifa propaganda for a while now. One commenter on Perry's wrote, Left alone, the Nazis would march right through town and out the other side. Antifa will bring the violence. Another added, uh, George Soros invading Newton, Georgia. Of course, George Soros is Jewish. And the neo-Nazis are not. However, a a stray Facebook post from a self-described patriot does not appear to be the only bit of social media flotsam that informed local authorities' massive security presence. Uh, Another Facebook post shared by the city from an account called Valdosta Antifa, that post pledged that 10,000 Antifa protesters would show up at the rally and they were going to erect a uh, statue of Polly Shore and turn the frickin' gut frogs gay. Now, of course, the post, as it is, is clearly satirical. You know, Valdos, Valdosta Antifa is really just three kids in a trench coat and fake mustache, right? Right? It's unclear why the city posted uh, that post in a request for information about security preparations. But, you know, you better not be turning uh, the frogs gay. Do not turn the freaking frogs gay. And Polly Shore? That sounds bad on the face of it. No one's erecting a statue of Polly Shore. The cops believe this. Okay. Fake Antifa posts have, of course, fooled others, but the local officials tasked with keeping Newton safe appear to be the first police and security officers so clearly fooled by fake Antifa material and to have that fake material inform their own security decisions. Well, the first to be found out. Up in the Bistro Cafe, part of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays, is an article by Ian Milheiser out of Think Progress. You know, representing Donald Trump is a lawyer's worst nightmare. And he just gave his own administration's lawyers another reason to cringe. The primary reason why Trump's Muslim ban has taken some occasional beatings in federal court is pretty simple. 
Donald Trump cannot stop making public statements that undermine his own legal arguments. As a candidate, he bragged about his intention to ban Muslims from entering the country. Then he bragged about the pretext he would use to make his ban appear legal. Then, when the ban was in hot water, legally speaking, and his lawyers were trying to convince courts that it wasn't handed down because Trump harbors bigoted animus towards Muslims, Trump shared several anti-Muslim videos on Twitter. And so it came to pass that the subject of Trump's Muslim ban came up during a joint press conference with Nigerian Prime Minister Buhari on Monday. Now, if Trump were smart, he would have kept his mouth shut. But uh, the president of the United States is like a cartoon supervillain who, having captured the hero, decides to reveal the details of his evil plan. So uh, what happened is that, uh, of course, there was uh, the oral arguments in front of the uh, in front of the Supreme Court between uh, Attorney Neil Katal, who argued against the Muslim ban during last week's arguments in Trump v. Hawaii. And he had an exchange with uh, Chief Justice John Roberts. On his face, Trump's proclamation announcing the Muslim ban is not an explicitly anti-Muslim document. It restricts foreign nationals from several majority Muslim nations from entering the country, but it also purports to do so for national security reasons. This led uh, Justice Roberts to wonder whether Trump could save this proclamation by disavowing all those statements where he expressed anti-Muslim animus. Now, Kat Yall struggled to answer Roberts' question completely as he was hit with additional questions from Roberts and Sam Alito, but the lawyer's answer indicated that Trump would significantly bolster his case if he were to disavow his previous anti-Muslim statements. And yet, when Trump had an opportunity to do just that, at Monday's press conference, he did the opposite. A reporter asked Trump about that exchange between Roberts and Kat Yall, and Trump said he would not back away from his past statements because there's no reason to apologize for being a racist. He didn't say for being a racist, but he gave racist statements, and he has no reason to apologize. Oops. Well, you know, I've I'm, I'm got a bit of journalism in my blood, and so I'm not really able to discern intent. Can you? Well, let's go to our break, and we'll come back, and then we'll go through weather from around the world, and uh, we'll ponder that question as well. But we'll do go through weather from around the world, and then finish up with the uh, stories that we've curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, and we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new earth. This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Steve Mursky. Labeling is much better than it used to be. Marion Burroughs, retired New York Times food columnist. And when you read the labels, you should really read them very, very <laughs> carefully because they'll give you all kinds of clues that you didn't expect to see. Burroughs spoke April 24th at a symposium honoring NYU food researcher Marion Nessel called Marion Nessel and the State of Food, Policy, Media, Education, and More. And not a lot of people are now la- labeling you with GMOs. I don't worry about GMOs as much as I worry about the pesticides that are put on GMOs. I think that they're uh, very, very questionable. There are a lot of side. There's big, big disagreement in the scientific community. So there's nothing in food today that isn't political. But what is changing to a certain extent is what consumers expect from their food. And it's a whole lot more than they used to expect. They want fresh food. They want Clean food. I'm not sure they know what clean food means, and I'm not sure I know what clean food means either. I don't think it has anything to do whether it's been washed or not, though. (laughs) How many people know about romaine lettuce in this audience right now? A recent E. coli outbreak traced to romaine from Yuma, Arizona, has so far hospitalized almost 50 people around the country. 
The CDC has recommended avoiding romaine unless it's definitely not from the Yuma area. The federal government says they're not going to do any more than tell everybody that this is a problem and not to eat it. Uh, They're not going to look any further into it because the romaine will be coming from somewhere else than than the place where it's coming from right now, so everything will be settled. Well, everything won't be settled. But that's the kind of government you have to deal with, so you have to be your own scientist, your own investigator. You maybe have to spend more time in the supermarket than you really want to spend in the supermarket. But the other kinds of things people are anxious to have are things that are very easy and quick to do, but are very healthful. So they, they want purity. They want A lot of people want organics. I can go into uh, Walmart and get lots and lots of organics. Well, that's the last place in the world I would ever have expected to find organics, but you can find them. So what you, would, what you have today is a combination of some things getting better, but you can't ever let down your guard. And even though it's a, really a pain in the neck, you have to look very carefully at everything you buy and listen and don't pay any attention to any of the advertising, none of it, because that's not really what's, what you uh, need to know. For Scientific American's 60 Second Science, I'm Steve Mursky. Welcome to 60 Second Civics, the daily podcast of the Center for Civic Education. I'm Mark Gage. George Mason has been called an almost forgotten man in the pantheon of revolutionary heroes. Although George Mason University in Virginia bears his name and his portrait hangs in the Capitol building in Washington, D.C., He is more often remembered for refusing to sign the Constitution at the conclusion of the Philadelphia Convention in 1787 than for his many contributions to this nation. Historian Pauline Mayer summed up why Mason deserves a place in the pantheon of revolutionary heroes. She says, George Mason was not a dissident by nature. He was a builder, not a naysayer. The man who drafted Virginia's first state constitution— and the powerfully influential Declaration of Rights enacted in early June of 1776, whose affirmation that all men are born equally free and independent found its way, with some variations, into several other state bills of rights, as well as the Declaration of Independence. His work on Virginia's Constitution and Declaration of Rights earned him a fame that he, unlike other members of his generation, did not crave. That's all for today's podcast, 60 Second Civics, where civic education only takes a minute. And this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1952. That was the day 100,000 oil refinery workers went out on strike. The work stoppage was called by a coalition of 22 unions, including AFL and CIO affiliates and independent unions. They demanded a 25-cent hourly wage increase with shift differentials. Shutdowns began at once, and picket lines were up as soon as procedures were safely completed. The strike threatened to cut production in half. Union leaders called all but the California refinery workers out, who were central to the war effort in Korea. Oil barons had given refinery workers the runaround for eight months during contract negotiations. The union had even postponed the original strike date in March to give federal mediation a chance in effecting a settlement. When this failed, President Harry Truman brought the case to the Wage Stabilization Board, which issued a ruling favorable to the industry. 80 companies demanded separate hearings for all 200 bargaining units involved. The union wanted one hearing for all. Even after this victory for the oil companies, they then refused to attend the hearings. When the board threw up its hands in mid-April, the new strike deadline was set. Eight days into the strike, the board ordered oil workers back to work, which they flat out refused. The oil workers union stated, quote, Strikers are fighting against a stacked deck. If corporation executives are permitted to ignore workers' needs, then to manipulate the government so the right to strike is denied, collective bargaining will be destroyed. The board then set a 15 cent an hour wage cap and shift differentials. Workers were back on the job by the end of the month, having avoided possible Taft-Hartley actions from President Truman. 
Labor History in Two, brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. For more information, go to laborhistoryin2.com, like us on Facebook, and follow us on the Twitters at Labor History in Two. This is Solidarity News on Radio Labor. This is a Radio Labor report recorded on Wednesday, May 2nd, 2018. I'm Mark Boulanger. The problem at the moment is that all these center-left parties are discredited among a large section of workers, ordinary people, and so on. That is Charles Taylor, one of the world's most respected philosophers. He is the inaugural winner of the Million Dollar Bear Gruen Prize. The prize honors thinkers whose, quote, ideas have both intellectual depth and long-term social and practical value across nations and cultures. Dr. Taylor is Professor Emeritus at McGill University in Montreal. On the CBC program Ideas, he was asked how, in the age of Trump, a large number of workers have come to believe that the system works against them. Well, that came to be, I think, by the real long-standing decline in democracy over several, Western democracy over several decades. They're not wrong to feel that they don't count because the levers they used to have to get their message across have gradually uh, weakened and, dis- and disappeared. I mean, I'm thinking of uh, immediately after the war, you had these, uh, we had these effective center-left parties with very large memberships and trade union movement with very large memberships. So you had something behind you if you were a worker who was unemployed or having a really hard time. There was legislation they could propose and some of it was proposed and carried through and really helped create that period of 30 years after the war where everyone had a job and But uh, now, when somebody feels I've lost my last uh, permanent job and I'm now in precarious situation and so on, where can I turn for help? The center-left parties just don't seem to have it in most countries. I mean, think of the United States with the Democratic Party or Britain with the Labour Party. And that itself changes the whole outlook that people have. I I really think that... The growth of magical thinking in our epoch, Trump says, I'm going to reverse the whole thing. How? Well, (laughs) I'll do it. Just trust me (laughs) that that is a creation of this sense of impotence. Rational thinking implies that you have some idea of what you can do, what the cause-effect relations, where you can push buttons somewhere, right? And when you really lose that and you lose even a sense of what it was like, right, then First of all, you get tremendous resentment. You think these elites that used to be leading these parties don't care for us. They're not interested in us and so on. And there's some truth in that. You only not only get resentment, but you also get the kind of magical thinking where the people who swear strongest against that leadership seem to you to be, oh, yeah, they're getting somewhere. They're saying something true. And, and then you don't look too closely at the actual mechanisms they're proposing. There is this sense that the elites have let them down, the traditional liberal center-left elites, and that they have to break out of that. And what the the alternative offers is a massive breakout, Brexit breaking out of Europe. I mean, it always means that they find scapegoats for this, which are not always totally wrong. I mean, they're right to think that neoliberalism has not... uh, taken care of large parts of the working class in an epoch of, of a globalization. But they also find in their, if you like, their identity worries, they find a good channel to express this sense of resentment and a sense of being let down. I think democracy depends on a sense of what I call citizen efficacy in a large number of people, particularly non-elites, a sense that there's somewhere you can go, some levers you can push, some votes you can make. And um, that revivifies democracy. Just think back eight years. What was the great slogan of Obama's campaign? It was, yes, we can. Right? And that speaks to a sense of it's impossible, we can't. But yeah, yeah, we can. We can by getting together, we can by organizing, etc. <clears throat> when that goes, then a, a real kind of panic takes over. 
a real sense that it's getting worse, out of control. It'll go on getting worse when people reach for anything, any kind of slogan. And that's it. International labor news you can use. Thank you for listening. And remember, it's all about global solidarity. you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Smothered Benedict Wednesdays, that's right. So uh, we'll begin with weather from around the world, and we always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States, where it is currently 41 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, the surrounding area is a bit cooler, but uh, my uh, my little uh, digital weather station that doesn't uh, link up to Weather Underground, unfortunately. But I'm registering 41, and that feels about right uh, on my mammalian syndrome cheek grade. And uh, yeah, 41 degrees. Uh, looks like we'll be drying out a bit warmer today. We're going to be in the upper 70s, might be hitting 80. And we will uh, stick around uh, low to mid 80s for the next week or so. Looking forward now to about a quarter inch of rain from thunder showers on Saturday. So we'll look forward to that. At least I always do. And uh, lows will be in the low to mid 50s here where the mothership is along the banks of the Rogue River. Indeed, air quality index is good, but at the upper reaches of good at 34 parts per million is about to turn moderate. Oh, daytime UV is at a high of, uh, it is high at seven. So I better put on, wear that hat and put on some sunscreen. High pressure, it looks like it's dominating at 30.303 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles. Humidity, though, is at 90%. Ooh. Okay, well, yeah, I guess what we'll have that. Winds are out, currently out of the south-southwest at 2 miles per hour. Will remain light and variable. And uh, looks tomorrow like they'll be out of the north-northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Indeed. All right, weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world. London is 57 with rain. Paris is 63 and partly cloudy. Rome is 73 and partly cloudy, though they do have a wind advisory that could impact infrastructure. Kiev is 87 and fair. Uh, Kabul is 63 and mostly cloudy. Good thing, too. Hong Kong is 76 and fair. Uh, Tokyo is 65 with a rain shower with a uh, uh, warning of flash floods. Ooh. Boy, that's a lot of rain then. Sydney, Australia is 61 and clear. Uh, San Francisco, California is 51 degrees and mostly cloudy. And New York, New York is 82 degrees. Oh, my gosh. 82 degrees and clear with a uh, what? What do we have here? We have some sort of advisory. Now I have to go to another, it's an active statement. What's happening in New York? Oh, an enhanced risk of fire spread this afternoon with wind gusts uh, increase from 20 to 30 miles per hour as relative humidities fall to around 30%. So, wow, increased hot, uh, fire danger uh, along the New York seaboard. So do take care. And that is... Weather from around the world, brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property, and these people positively live around the world.
Starting off in the chef's table here at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, uh, Smothered Benedict Wednesdays, is an article by Carolyn Orr out of Share Blue Media. Looks like uh, Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein is not backing down in the face of attacks from Trump's congressional allies. Re- congressional Republicans threatening to impeach him. Rosenstein fired back at GOP lawmakers yesterday, defiantly stating that the Department of Justice is not going to be extorted. Now, who would be extorting something from the DOJ if they could? Crooks? Interesting. Rosenstein made the comments during an appearance at the museum in Washington, Washington, D.C. to celebrate Law Day. Not Loyalty Day, Law Day. Asked about threats from members of Congress, including a draft of articles of impeachment against him prepared by Trump's congressional allies, Rosenstein made it clear that he would not be intimidated by the Republicans' thinly failed effort to disrupt the Russia probe. I can tell you that there have been people who have been making threats, privately and publicly, against me for quite some time, and I think they should understand by now. The Department of Justice is not going to be extorted. We are going to do what's required by the rule of law, he added. Any threats that people make are not going to affect how we do our job. But you know what? Cops have a memory. They do. Rosenstein did not go into detail about the threats he was addressing, but as the DOJ's top official overseeing the Russia probe, he has become the focus of intense criticism from congressional Republicans seeking to shield Trump from scrutiny in special counsel Mueller's investigation. Rosenstein has also drawn the ire of Trump, who blames him for launching the special counsel investigation. Well, Donnie, two scoops if you hadn't fired uh, Comey. Would we really have a uh, special prosecutor? Maybe. In a recent Rage tweet, Trump lashed out directly at Rosenstein, suggesting that he was conflicted because he lawfully reauthorized an ongoing surveillance warrant of former Trump campaign advisor Carter Page. Strangely, Trump also referred to Rosenstein, a Republican, who was appointed to become a U.S. attorney by George W. Bush, and then handpicked by Trump to serve as the number two official at the DOJ as a Democrat loyalist. Not Democratic, Democrat. Much of the bad blood with Russia is caused by the fake and corrupt Russia investigation, headed up by all the Democrat loyalists or people who work for Obama. Mueller is most conflicted of all. Except Rosenstein, who signed the FISA and Comey letter. No collusion, so they go crazy. That was Trump, by the way. CNN reported last month that the White House was preparing a smear campaign at undermining Rosenstein's credibility. As part of that effort, Trump reportedly planned to use his allies in Congress and right-wing media as attack dogs to go after Rosenstein, hoping to build a case for firing him without looking like he's interfering in the Russia probe. Now, isn't this interesting? This is right out of the Putin playbook. This is exactly out of the Putin playbook. I wonder where he got it. Now, Republicans appear to be going along with a plan led by California Representative Mark... Oh, I'm sorry, North Carolina Representative Mark Meadows. The right-wing House Freedom Caucus recently drafted a document that could be used to remove Rosenstein from office. It was leaked to the Washington Post on Monday. Now, I'm curious. The Freedom Caucus, of course, is the Tea Party. And the Tea Party is total astroturf. Has there been some business dealings going on with a hostile foreign power that is helping a particular group like the Tea Party, the AstroTurf Tea Party, to wrest control of this representative democratic republic from we the people? Is that possible? Now, during uh, the question and answer session on Tuesday, Rosenstein took a swipe at the GOP lawmakers who prepared the document, saying they can't even resist leaking their own drafts. And they can't. Rosenstein also hit back at Republicans for suggesting that he is doing something improper by not turning over certain internal DOJ documents. 
uh, concerning aspects of the Russia investigation and the Hillary Clinton email probe. He said the department is not going to just open the doors and let Congress rummage through files, noting that doing so might result in a violation of DOJ policies or laws. Trump doesn't care about that. He demands loyalty. It doesn't matter what the laws are. Now, I saw that draft, Rosenstein said, referring to the GOP's so-called impeachment articles against him. It really does illustrate a really important distinction between the way we operate in the Department of Justice. If we're going to accuse somebody of wrongdoing, we have to have admissible evidence and credible witnesses. We need to be prepared to prove our case in court, and we have to affix our signature to the charging document. We have people who are accountable. Rosenstein got in one more jab, adding, I just don't have anything to say about documents like that, that nobody has the courage to put their name on. And this is just the latest gesture of confidence from an emboldened Rosenstein, who appears to be growing more defiant as the attacks from Trump and his allies ramp up. Instead of backing down, Rosenstein is responding to Republican threats by daring them to continue and there's likely a reason for Rosenstein's confidence. And it's almost certainly not good news for Trump. Don't say maintenant Sous l'été, les pieds nus dans le sable Don't say Et j'étais vos ennuis dans les parcs qui dansent. Okay, as Providence would have it, I've just really gone on quite long here, and I can't devote a whole lot of time to this last story by Natasha Geeling out of Think Progress about science textbooks seriously underreporting climate change. A new study published in the Journal of Environmental Communication holds a worrying message for public understanding of climate science. Less than 4% of the pages in the most popular introductory physics, biology, and chemistry books, now these are college-level courses, published between 2013 and 2015, were devoted to discussing climate change, just 4%. And uh, what the researchers did is that they combed through 15,000 pages of current editions from 16 textbooks published by four prominent textbook publishers over the three-year period, looking for any mention of climate change or relevant topics like fossil fuel extraction or renewable energy, and they only found 4%. And, of course, we know that that's a feature, not a bug. What you don't know can't keep them from making money off off you, can it? Okay, well, uh, the links are provided in my show notes and links, so look up for that. Look for that, and uh, I'll read the rest of the article by Ms. Geeling, please. All right, well, we're going to have to bug out of here. Stay tuned to Netroots Radio for the rest of the day. We'll meet up tomorrow, of course, for Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. But do stay tuned to uh, Netroots Radio for the rest of the day for breaking news, and we'll break in if the really big breaking news happens, as we've been warning you. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio, and we will visit with you tomorrow in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du...
tu ferais d'Aster Revoir un laté Je voudrais toujours te plaire T'en mange un d'un d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair Embrasser les yeux ouverts T'en mange à d'un hiver Ma robe à fleurs Sous la pluie d'un novembre Tes mains qui courent Je n'en peux plus de retendre Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver 